Darfur, the site of one of the largest humanitarian crises in recent memory. Life's been unkind to eight-year-old Fatan, six-year-old Takawa, and three-year-old Hitibi. Like thousands of other children here in Darfur, these children are orphans, their father killed in the conflict. Without your help, there's little hope for their future. Every day they face the danger of starvation, of conflict, and of disease. This is one of the largest population displaced in the world. Over half the population of Darfur is affected by the conflict. The amount of people in need is going to increase. We need uh, medicines. You know what to see on the ground is beyond anybody's imagination. Bismarck, uh, Noah? Amr. Amr? Umrah? It's in the Asha? These are the children of Darfur. This is the largest humanitarian crisis anywhere in the world today, with hundreds of thousands of children in camps like these. It's also the story of one of the largest, fastest, and most successful humanitarian relief efforts ever. We'll have a look during this hour at how organizations like the International Medical Corps have been able to save the children of Darfur. Children in Darfur grow up far too fast. Often young girls like Fatan are left with the burden of raising their brothers and sisters. Their stories are unimaginable. <laughs> How old are you? At only eight years old, Fatan has already lived a lifetime of sorrow. What happened to your village? <laughs> In 2003, rebel forces attacked Fatan's home of Gerar. The village was burned to the ground and its population of five to 6,000 people were left homeless. Fatan's father was murdered while trying to defend his family in the attack. Fatan narrowly escaped with the rest of her family, including her mother, who at the time was pregnant with her baby brother, Hitibi. Now in a small camp hundreds of miles from home, Fatan is left to care for her siblings while her mother leaves early in the morning to graze their small herd of animals. All across Darfur, children are the biggest victims of the violence that's plagued this country. The capital of West Darfur is Al Janina. Just outside the city limits lies Riyadh Camp, a large protected settlement established for internally displaced peoples, or IDPs. Living conditions are stripped to the bare necessities, but the camp provides a small measure of safety for the 15,000 people who now call it home. Along the narrow pathways of the settlement, we find Rashida, a nine-year-old girl, just one of the many displaced by the violence. Three years ago, Rashida was happy and thriving in her home village of Suan. Her days were carefree, and along with her two brothers, she attended a local school. Then one day, her village was attacked by gunmen. As the men stormed the town, spraying bullets and setting fire to the homes in their path, Rashida's brother was shot dead in front of her. She was only six years old. With their home destroyed, Rashida and her family were forced to flee, leaving the body of their brother and son behind. Together, they made their way by foot with little but the clothes on their backs to Riyadh camp, where they have joined the ranks of thousands of other IDPs. Within the camp, the displaced are cared for by doctors of International Medical Corps, or IMC.
IMC is an American humanitarian aid organization which focuses on training local populations so they once again can become self-reliant. IMC specializes in treating children under five and women of childbearing age, providing quality specialty care in the most remote and dangerous parts of the planet. Jill John Call is an American physician who has dedicated her life and her career to making a difference in the lives of the dispossessed. Can we see your baby? <laughs> Having previously worked in Uganda and Chad, Dr. Jill began her work with IMC in Darfur in 2005 as field medical coordinator. Now, two years later, she is medical director in Darfur. Well, we're a medical organization, so we focus on health, generally speaking. In terms of the women and children that come in, we give them uh, comprehensive primary health care services. So we are giving them services like outpatient consultations. If they're sick, they come and see the doctor. We give them medicine for free. We also do reproductive health services. So there are a lot of pregnant women coming, but where are they going to get their care? Where are they going to get their tetanus shots? Where are they going to get you know, clean delivery kits? So we provide those also. We also do nutritional surveillance for all the children under five to make sure that they have enough food, that they don't go into severe malnutrition. We try to catch them when they're either healthy or at risk. So we can follow them and monitor them and make sure that they don't become severely malnourished because once they cross that line, it's a hospital for them. While camps do provide some safety, venturing outside of their boundaries can be deadly. However, with fuel in short supply, children are often forced to leave the camps in search of firewood. Four months ago, Rashida had done just that. As she and a small group of children scoured the barren landscape for sticks, a pickup truck full of unidentified men drove up and began shooting at random. As the children ran for their lives, a stray bullet shattered Rashida's ankle. Left for dead, she escaped with her life but will remain crippled without highly specialized surgery. After spending two months at a hospital and two months in another clinic, Rashida and her family now rely on IMC to help dress and monitor her wound. Although her injury is healing, Rashida's past is still immensely painful. Having lost her home, her brother and her innocence, she is no longer the happy child she once was. Not even the presence of other children can give her comfort. Since arriving in the camp, Rashida has yet to return to school. Sadly, since the beginning of the conflict, stories like Rashida's are all too common. The conflict in Darfur erupted in February 2003 when rebels began attacking government bases, killing hundreds of soldiers and policemen. The rebels complained of decades of neglect and marginalization by the Khartoum government. Neglect which stretched back through the days of the British Empire to the late 19th century rule of the Mahdi. In this scene, we see rebel sympathizers trying to kill a government representative. I put my hand on him to stop him from being stoned to death. With conventional forces stretched thin, the government mounted a counterinsurgency operation using local militias. The ensuing battle between Sudanese rebels, the government, and cross-border skirmishes with Chadian militias displaced 2.2 million people from their homes, affecting over 4 million people in Darfur. Tens of thousands have died, but the exact number is widely disputed since the deaths are hard to count, ranging from 19,000 to over 200,000. 
At IMC's medical facility in Riyadh camp, physicians and healthcare workers provide critical emergency medical services, as well as family medicine, immunizations, and health education to a population of over 15,000. This morning, doctors are alerted that an emergency case has arrived. This is Zahra and her 11-month-old baby boy. He has severe pneumonia. You can see that he's breathing very quickly here. There are attractions here between his ribs. He has a very high fever and a very, very fast pulse. Without treatment, a child like this doesn't last long. Pneumonia is one of the number one killers out in Darfur for young children. Fortunately, because of the International Medical Corps, he's now getting an intravenous antibiotic. This will quickly get into his system to be able to treat the infection and to save his life. It's the work being done in clinics such as this one that has made the humanitarian response in Darfur, as difficult as it is, as successful as it is. Yeah.